All right, you are good to go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. So we are very happy to have our very own um, Dr. Gray, uh, Jake Granz out here, who is our um, international renowned, renowned plastic surgeon here in the South Bay and here talking to us today. Um, a little bit about him. He is a Southern California native, uh, I believe Santa Monica and um, attended school in Princeton, graduated from there with honors in chemical engineering and um, a certificate in engineering biology, then went ahead and attended medical school in Tulane and finished his residency in head, neck and, head and neck surgery at the University of Southern California, as well as plastic surgery at the University of Miami. Um, so thank you for being here with us today. So today's topic, we are going over a little bit of um, breast cancer, touching upon that, and the bulk of our conversation in this interview will be about lymphedema because that is Dr. Granzel's specialty and he is very one of the very few um, surgeons in, in the US and the world to do um, a lot of these procedures. So to start, um, Dr. Granzel, would you mind giving us just kind of a quick overview of when patients come to you, they've already had the reconstruction majority of the time, correct? Correct. For breast cancer. Most, most of the time when I see patients for lymphedema, they've had treatment for breast cancer, which is the reason that they have their lymphedema. So lymphedema is a disorder of lymphatic system circulation, the lymphatic system being part of the immune system. And that circulation uh, uh, involves fluid called lymph or lymphatic fluid. That's a clear fluid that basically washes your arms and your legs all the time. It's a continuous washing mechanism and a cleaning mechanism. And what that does is it surveillances things, it picks up cancer cells and your body kills 99.999% of cancer cells that ever come up in the normal way uh, or a very high number. It, it'll take dirt particles, bacteria particles, and it brings them out, has them filtered through little filters called lymph nodes and eventually puts that fluid back into the venous side or the venous system where further you, your body has antibiotics and other um, mechanisms to treat that and any, anything extra is taken out by the kidneys. So when there's a problem with the circulation, things get blocked up is when you have something called lymphedema, which is a disorder of that disease. Most of the time lymphedema occurs in the United States because there's treatment for some sort of cancer. So for example, breast cancer, if the lymph nodes are removed as part of that treatment, because again, they're filtering those, they're the catchment system for the, the cancer that's spreading from the breast. So they need to investigate it or taken out if the cancer is spread there, but they also happen to drain the adjacent arm in a lot of cases. And so that might block up and cause that arm to start swelling. You can have it in the Hi, leg Ms. too. Hi, this is Julie from Dr. Granzo's office. Is this a good time to chat or would you prefer a different time? Sorry, uh, Julie, if you can um, mute, please. I'll, I'll continue on. So, um, Continuing on with the, uh, if, you, if you remove lymph nodes, those things can back up. Same thing can happen with GYN cancer for the legs. And then people can have just congenital failures, meaning from birth, their system isn't as robust as other people have it. And so over time this fails and you get the same pattern of buildup of fluid and then solid. And at first it's always fluid that builds up, which can be treated with conservative therapy, PT, OT, someone who really knows lymph, but someone who knows lymphedema therapy. It can also be treated with a microsurgical reconstruction where I can actually reconstruct that lymphatic system by moving lymph nodes into the area where they've been taken out, or I can connect the lymphatic little channels. They're usually 0.1 to 0.9 millimeters in diameter, so very tiny, wow. into the venous system directly. But if that progresses, eventually that fluid, which is really toxic and really inflammatory, causes a lot of damage to that arm or leg because it's sitting there. And permanent solids, which include fat and proteins, accumulate as well. And those can't be just drained with normal methods or with those reconstructions. That means that your lymphedema goes from what we call stage one to a stage two, and that has to be handled differently. So there I really have to dredge everything out. I have to get the solids out first. It's a, it's a very specialized type of suction device. Um, machine and device that we have. I use a tourniquet, which is an orthopedic device, which you would use in a, a knee surgery or so. And then I have to downstage and really get you back from a stage two, get rid of those solids, get you back down to a stage one where it can be treated with therapy or microsurgery later. 
But in all those cases, that cancer has been treated before and that cancer is going to be stable or in remission. Um, breast reconstruction has usually occurred by that point, although sometimes we can add that in as well. Gotcha. So now when we talk about lymphedema and um, other, other uh, treatments prior to it of radiation or um, chemotherapy, now, is that done in conjunction? Do we wait until a patient is in remission and has all of these needs or kind of where does that fall in the grand scheme of treatment with you? Absolutely. So it's an excellent question. Even before, sir, I, I mean, I prefer that patients at least be educated about lymphedema right from the beginning to know what to watch out for, because it's a very common problem and it's extremely un underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed as a swelling. If it's a leg, it might be seen as maybe there's a blood clot in the leg causing that swelling. We see that quite frequently too. So patients need to know that, hey, they're having cancer treatment, swelling in an arm or leg could occur, in which case your first step is going to be going to someone like you or your, your group there with lymphedema therapists who can treat any swelling that occurs. Now, sometimes that swelling is just temporary or transient. It's just after surgery or just that lymphatic system has to catch up and, and right. get to a new steady state. And the normal treatments, which include, for example, massage therapy, which can massage that fluid out. You can have compression therapy, which will be say a garment that's a stocking or a, a glove or a sleeve. Um, there are pumps that you can use. There are different modalities to, to help keep that down and to hopefully keep it from progressing. And so that needs to be, that needs to occur in any case. And whether that swelling is ultimately due to lymphedema or some other reason or just post-surgical, you will heal faster and better if you get that therapy right away. Yeah, agreed. We do get a lot of um, post mastectomy breast cancer patients who do come in with a little bit of swelling and it comes down like for me personally, it comes down to, okay, where, where has the education been? How long are they out from surgery? And is there another reconstruction coming? Like, where is that? Uh, when we try to make sure we mitigate some of the uh, swelling in the arm, let's just say if they've had lymph nodes removed, that's generally one of the questions we ask. Um, so I guess another question would be, how many lymph nodes removal in, let's just say the axillary area is too much then, and at what point is it lymphedema versus you know swelling following surgery? Uh, excellent question. And the answer is, that it's different for everyone because everyone starts with a lymphatic system that has a different capacity. Right. And one way to think, of, think about it, it's a very oversimplified way of thinking about it, but it's, it makes it easier to comprehend is that if you take the driving test, you just need 70 to pass, 70%. That's yeah. it. Nobody cares if you get 80 or 90%, you just need 70. And for your lymphatic system, you just need enough, just barely to drain that arm or leg. Any additional capacity will rel go relatively unnoticed unless you're hot or sweating or you're drinking Bloody Marys on the airplane or doing something that's extremely high risk for say lymphedema, gardening the roses, you get swelling. And I think everybody to some extent who gets lymphedema even after surgery has some predisposition, meaning that say you have eight lymphatic channels and you only need two to drain the arm and you have surgery and it knocks out five of them, you still have three, you'll never ever notice. That's why 60% of people don't get lymphedema, even with very, very invasive surgeries. Again, these are necessary things to treat the cancer and radiation therapy, which will further can further harm that area. But again, necessary to treat the cancer. These are not things that are being done wrong or badly, by the way. These are, these are side effects from something that's saving people's lives and making them getting that cancer treated. Okay. So that, that's a, that's an important distinction. Um, so, so it's hard to tell how many are too many in that sense. Sometimes uh, that now we've decreased, for example, with breast cancer, the incidence of lymphedema quite a lot because surgeons don't necessarily have to go and get all the lymph nodes out when they notice that there's one, you know, that there's maybe a lymph node or, or say you have a big tumor in the breast. It used to be if the tumor is big enough, you have to go take the lymph nodes all out in the axilla to make sure that none of them have cancer. Now we have something called a sentinel node biopsy, which means you take the main lymph node that drains the breast, take that one lymph node out or that one small group of lymph nodes out, leave the rest of them behind, and you drop your incidence of lymphedema from 20 to 40% down to 4%, so four, and that's it. Now it's still, so it's better to take less, but there's still that incidence of, of, of lymphedema. And why is it that 4%? Well, those 
people maybe start with only three and they take out one channel. I'm again, I'm oversimplifying and now uh -huh. you're, or take out two and now you're, you're down to having that issue. Okay. Um, so then secondary stuff, the thing that we talk about, you had mentioned is um, compressive garments, right? So do you mind going over a little bit as to the measurement and how often someone should be measured for compression garments if they're under your care for lymphedema? Yep. So for me, what I do is I very much rely on the lymphedema therapist to make the exact decisions for how often and, and what kind of garment is is required each time. There's a lot of um, each each person has a, a a different way that they treat yeah. patients. So if we're watching baseball, which has now come back, if if you have 10 hitters on the, or nine hitters on the team, they are all really good hitters. Right. But if I wanted my son to learn how to play baseball, I'm going to send him to one of them right. and have him teach it because the three guys all hit differently. They all can do well, but they're going to have a different approach. So gotcha. typically my general guidelines are going to be, I'm going to um, want uh, at least some compression going on, at least initially, and having that as an option for the patient so that if they're at high risk, for example, they're flying on an airplane, they're, they're having a bad day, they're in a hot environment, they're gardening the roses and, you know, and, and they can get scratched or whatever happens to be, um, they have that garment to fall back on. Whether that's a custom garment or an off the shelf garment is up to the therapist. Um, again, anybody that's more than just a little bit involved is gonna tend to benefit tremendously from having a custom fit garment that's a flat knit mm -hmm garment that's a type of garment that's a little more strict and stringent but it really works and that at least provides sort of a memory back for that armor leg that hey this is where that armor leg needs to be it gets trained every day for a certain amount of time and then we can recover whatever the patient's activities are gotcha so from my end right a lot of times we'll do the mantle drainage um we clear from top down through the umbilicus as well and then we talk about compression garments and essentially depending on their work environment or their lifestyle we tell them if i had a patient who sits at a desk a lot she was getting um, lymphedema in the upper as well as the lower extremities so we had talked about um, ankle pumping and all those things making sure she raises her limbs throughout the day what is the long-term management look like for someone that does have um, lymphedema in the first stage, let's just say? Yeah, so long-term management will be keeping it, first of all, everybody needs to keep a good relationship with their lymphedema therapist. So they need to, they need to be on track and that therapist is gonna be the most hands-on, the most close with that patient and their lymphedema. So they'll know, hey, do I need to come back once a week? Can I come back once a month? Can I come back once every six months? And I think that's the, then, and then the treatments that are decided are going to be, is it a compression garment? Is it a pump? Is it a, is it a series of manual lymphatic drainage therapies that you have? And so that will hold most patients with stage one lymphedema, meaning you just have fluid, but you haven't had it progressed and damage your tissue so much that you have those permanent solids also set in. Now those patients, I think that will work well for a lot of patients. Some patients definitely, and, and the patients that want to say, okay, I'd like to decrease the amount of compression garment that I need to wear. Well, then we might even consider surgery where I might make some connections and very early ones. Yeah, you're stuck with these until the end of the summer. So you better take good care of them because if I have to come from deal to here to fix a wire, I'm gonna be so upset. Oh, pardon Rachel, we're, we're hearing you on the, um, on the video. Anyway, the, um, but say I wanted to augment the drainage more than, the, more than just the compression garment, I can perform a lymphatic venous anastomosis, for example, on the hand or on the wrist, or a series of several, make some connections and make that garment more effective, make that therapy more effective, because now you have additional drainage that's happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And those are very small, very minimally invasive procedures that we can do to really make people better. Um, if they wanna add a, a step above that, we can add a lymph node transfer at that point too before things progress. Gotcha. And then with your lymph node transfers, where are they generally harvested from? Yep. So you're going to borrow it from areas where the patient has excess, which are most of your bodies have redundant systems and backup systems. So you'll have more lymph nodes in the area than you need. 
and I can actually find out. And how do you do that? That's that's a a very important question. And I actually perform some very sophisticated imaging before both with the radiology department and then also in the operating room to make sure that we're just borrowing things that are excess mm -hmm. and that we don't damage an area. For example, in the groin area is, is an area that I like to borrow because we have extra. It, the inside or the medial aspect where your vessels are, so the, the artery and the vein that feed the leg, they tend to have the areas of lymph nodes that also drain the lymphatics in the leg. If you go out towards the hip, then those will drain the more hip area, but that more of the hip area, but there's so much redundance and excess capacity in that area that they can flow up into different areas and into those other ones that I can borrow a couple gotcha. from the area. And I'll borrow an artery and a vein with those. I'll disconnect those and sort of like moving your say toaster from one side of the kitchen to the other, we disconnect that little tiny electric cable, mm -hmm. plug it in, but that little tiny cable makes that big machine work. And in the same way, we'll be able to make that lymph node flap work until healing occurs and it actually heals into the tissue. Arteries and veins heal into that tissue and the lymphatics heal into that tissue too. So now those lymph nodes that have been transferred can now drain that new site. And again, it often doesn't take much to make a really big difference in, in how a person's drainage is occurring. Especially in the armpit tour, the axilla, there's a lot of scarring that happens after the axillary dissection where you know that you've, I'm sure you've experienced the cords and the bands and, and the limitation of motion that there's there, the radiated tissue really socks in it and gets very firm and hard and bringing healthy non-radiated tissue already relieves that. What we do is we go in and we actually snap all those scar bands. We release that shoulder. Those bands are also compressing the vein that provides drainage in the arm so that we sometimes get immediate results like in the hospital from the procedure. And we know that's just from the release because they, the, the healing hasn't happened. That'll take at least weeks to months to occur. And so we, we add all those benefits as well. And so that, that is something. And, and the amount of tissue you're talking about is like half or a quarter of the size of a computer mouse. I'm talking old school, small one, not some big, yeah. big one, but a little one. And we just move a little bit and it leaves a, a scar that looks that's basically in the groin crease, which is the, the crease that occurs when your leg attaches to your torso, there's a line and then it'll lie in that line. Gotcha. So a couple of questions from the chat is how many nodes are removed or are moved? Mm -hmm. um, and my guess is it depends on how much you need, correct? It is. Um, typically, if you picture the, the, again, it's a very oversimplified analogy, but if you picture the lymph nodes in your groin area as a cluster of grapes, you have the main section of the grapes near the very, very tip with the little, just a couple on the end. Uh -huh. And all I'm doing is borrowing the ones on the end, so to speak, right out on the end with a little bit of the cable that goes in between, which is the artery and the vein. Uh -huh. There's, there are many, many, many redundant arteries and veins. And so that isn't almost ever an issue for, for borrowing those. And that's what we'll take typically we think we end up harvesting between one and four or two and four lymph nodes and bringing that over. And that's enough for, for a drainage. How do we know that? Well, we can't know for each individual patient because the only way to know how many lymph nodes are there is if you send them to the lab, they cut them up, section them, stain them, tell you back a few days later how many there are, which obviously doesn't work. Right. We know this, however, because I have had colleagues, for example, in Europe who've had this, who performed this procedure. And then later there's a cancer recurrence in that area and they have to resect that lymph node flap as part of the retreatment and then they actually can go back and count them oh, wow. and they typically find there are about two in there gotcha and then um another question is do we do you always harvest from one area um or do does it ever require multiple sites yep so each procedure is just one area for that day and just having those we do i do it in a very special way so that it'll be enough but not damage that donor site and I actually go through great pains and I do a lot of imaging. So I'm pretty compulsive in the operating room. And also I'm very, very watchful that we don't cause damage in that donor site. Those have been reported in rare instances in the literature, but they have been out there. I haven't had that issue happen. And what I do is I actually will image the legs and I will actually place tracer in the legs, a small amount of radioactive dye, which is, I mean, you're talking less than X-ray levels of radiation. They're, very, they're just tracers. And those go into the lymph nodes and I can actually map out the lymph nodes that take up the tracer that drain the leg. Mm. For example, the Jason area, I draw a line around that with a surgical pen and I don't go there. And I uh. just borrow things that are adjacent. So 
I have additional imaging techniques that image all the lymph nodes and therefore I get two maps. One is all the lymph nodes and one that drain the legs. And so then I have a very much more accurate understanding of what I can borrow, where I need to design that. And then I can accurately go to not only get a good result, but also to make sure we're safe with the patient. Awesome. And then another question is, what are the potential risks to the donor sites? Yep. So main risk or the biggest risk that everyone worries about is a lymphedema. That's a new lymphedema at that donor site or the adjacent area. And we take great pains to avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, I can't ever tell you that there will be a hundred percent guarantee that something won't happen. Um, that's not how life or medicine function. But again, we feel very confident and the risks would be much less than 1% that you would have an issue. And even less than that, because for me, if there's a doubt that there's a lymphatic taking something up, I leave it. I'd rather have a lesser result because we still also receive results from the scar release, for example, and the axilla and all these other things, just putting healthy tissue in there that I don't want to have it take a chance on the leg if necessary. If both legs image out that we can't harvest, or for example, I'll, I'll use the other leg as a backup and it's happened okay, once in a while, not very commonly that the lymph nodes don't follow, haven't read the textbook and they're out more lateral, meaning out towards the outside. I start making my incision. I start looking, I haven't divided anything. I say, hey, this flap can't be harvested without, for me, having some risk. Now, again, chances are very high that even if I took those, the patient would be fine, but that's not good enough. So I just close that side and I go to the other side as a backup. And we've done that maybe two or three times. So on the order of 1%, you know, one to 2% of, of patients might have that. I can also borrow from around the gut. So your ileum, which is your small bowel, has a lot of lymph nodes that help drain because food is dirty in the, in the surgical sense that the body is sterile on the inside, but outside is not. So there are all sorts of bacteria that live in food and other things that are there. And so your immune system has to work quite hard there. And so bar, there you can literally pick up next to the gut. There's something called a mesentery where the blood supply goes. And you can really just look right through it and you can pick them out and you just design a little flap with a vessel and that lymph node, and, the, and I do a general surgeon, so they close it together. And we can do that as a backup if we, if we needed to. Or say someone images out and they don't have good lymph nodes and they're growing that come up on a before test, we'll um, give that as an option. Awesome. So top three donor sites would be... Ingram. For me, it's going to be groin and ileum. Um, okay. Other people will borrow from over the shoulder or over the clavicle. I don't like that for a number of reasons. And it does put the arm at risk. So that I have actually seen someone who's had that harvested elsewhere who has had an arm lymphedema because there is this thought going around that that's immune. You never have an issue with an arm, but you can. They go underneath the chin. I think that's a very visible scar. You can get a facial weakness because there's a nerve that runs here. And again, those cause me more worry. So I haven't had to go past those, those other two sites because they've been very good. If we're going towards the leg, I'll actually borrow from the torso. So I won't borrow from the armpit. Same idea. I'll just borrow something right adjacent. Uh -huh. So you have a lot of collateral sites. And again, we're borrowing very small amounts and just get the appropriate vessel, whichever ones feed that. And then I'll plug it right into the inner thigh. And then what does healing look like at that point? So you've done all of the um, beautiful work that you have in the OR and patient is stable, does well. So what does recovery look like at that point following lymphedema surgery? Yep. So for a lymph node transfer surgery, we're just not going to allow compression to be applied to that area for the first two to three weeks, depending upon the patient typically, because that allows enough of the vascular ingrowth, meaning arteries and veins, they actually, whenever you have an incision or two sides, so if you have a laceration in your leg or you move a flap over, the new tissues that are next to each other will have arteries and veins and they actually grow together, find each other, reestablish the circulation and connect. So that's the most important part to, once that's established, we can compress and we can massage and do all those things over that. The lymphatics also find their way and connect also, and that's when they start to drain. But that usually doesn't happen for a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Initially, after surgery, the patient will be up and walking the day of their surgery. And you'll be doing essentially what you'd be doing on a Saturday or Sunday that you're not working out or going on a long bike ride or something like that, but an around the house one right away. Um, the surgery is relatively non-invasive because we stay relatively superficial. The surgical sites are small. The pain is usually quite minimal. 
and the recovery from uh, microsurgery is usually quite easy. If it's a lymphatic venous anastomosis, which is where I'm just connecting the, the lymphatics directly into the veins, I mean, your, your recovery is sort of like a glorified mole removal. The, 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 the skin area often doesn't hurt unless you push down on that. We keep your compression on for the first few weeks and then the patient is allowed to start to remove that and see how much less they need that thing. And those can happen right away too. So sometimes we do see improvements in the hospital, but usually I, my expectation will be weeks to months to see those improvement because we're really creating small, small drips. I mean, call it a drip, drip a minute or whatever you wanna say. And, uh, but that will flood your house eventually if you were let, to let your, your bathroom overflow. And, and in the same way, this will drain your armor like. And then um, what about how to avoid flares, right? Sometimes you'll have a patient doing long-term management, they do fairly well and they're discharged or whatever it may be. And then I get a phone call that's like, I need to see you because yep. things have gone awry. <laughs> yeah, so sure. how do you usually will have navigate that in the sense of managing flares for their activities of daily living, or when do they need to come back to see you if there is something a little bit more pressing? Right. I mean, I mean, flares are going to happen for everybody because everyone is going to have a bad day and, and just not do well, or they might party a little too hard, or they might fly in that plane and it just doesn't work out, or they go to altitude on a hike or something. Um, typically, most patients that we have, especially after the reconstructive type of procedures, have very few of those, or they're, they're much, much less. They know when they're coming. They just put the garment on. They might perform their own MLD. They might have a pump still that's sort of unused sitting around the basement. They break it out for that day and then or two, and then it's fine. Um, I still want them to stay on schedule because they do need to renew those garments. And, the, and we do see improvements even over years after surgery. So you'll still see some, you'll see most of the improvements in the first few months to year, but even at two, one, two, three, four, five years, you will see improvements. So that garment does need to be adjusted and downsized and made smaller to, to allow that, that arm to recover. So what I do is, have we gotten people out of garment full-time? We have with very early stages, but usually people are gonna need to be in a garment at least at some part of the day to at least train that one down. Whether So in an arm, I think typically I, we're gonna be out of the day during the day, every day is a very valid expectation. When you come home, you put it on, it trains you, and then you may or may not sleep in it at night. Um, but during the day, you're out, you'll be out for those activities. Um, so those flares in those cases are kind of few and far in between. And if they come up, they're, they're much less. But if they do have them, I do want them to come back to the therapist or you first, because you're going to know what that patient's issues are, where they build up. For example, on an arm, it'll usually be behind the elbow, at the forearm. Those are problem areas, maybe at the wrist and hand, whatever that is, we can have you massage those down. You might do one session or a couple of sessions, get back, make sure that garment hasn't kind of been neglected Great. and gotten away from them, <laughs> which happens a lot. Yeah. And then say, we need to, we need to get with ordering you a current one because a worn out garment won't, won't help you. And, and that tends to take care of them. Okay. Um, so good to know, but yeah, the, the gal that I was treating, same thing. She's, uh, it's been about 10 years. She's had on and off layers and it's one of those things where I'm like, when's the last time you switched this out? She's like, hey, it still works. Yep. Like, yeah, it's not going to help for the long run. Um, but what I've also found is a lot of the times the dietary changes, right? Like most of the patients do know it's kind of like your cardiovascular stuff, like excess sodium and all of those things. If they're dehydrated, it does tend to make things a little bit more flared and a little worse. Um, are there any dietary considerations to help manage lymphedema and pr like prior to surgery on the conservative side or if they do follow through with um, surgery and then as well as after? Yeah, for sure. So one thing that I think is pretty consistent with patients is that the more alcohol you drink, the worse you're gonna do. It, um, it seems to throw everyone off quite a lot. Uh, I think that the order your body gets that, you know, we're, we're all feeling this now, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to see 50 in <laughs> this year sometime. And so it, it's, uh, you, you feel it a lot more than you did 30 years ago. Right. And, and in lymphedema that just hastens that and, and pushes that forward. I think some, pa the rest of the things are going to be more patient specific. So high salt diet certainly doesn't help. So, um, altitude doesn't tend to help, um, drink, uh, eating the high carb, high fat diets tends to be worse. So just things that are generally unhealthy tend to be amplified by the lymphedema, 
but then the improvements you get of eating cleaner, watching yourself better are also magnified by that too. So you'll see a, a good improvement is generally what we see. Um, it's really patient specific though. So not everything that works for one patient will tend to work for that next patient. And then are there any concerns with um, exercising like cardio or weight training during post-op? Right. Uh, initially for the first, typically for me, the first three weeks, I don't have patients exercise or do cardio heavily. Um, walking 10, 15, even 20 minutes through the neighborhood is fine. I think that's good. I'm more hesitant on a bike ride because people do fall off their bike and even if they've been riding all the time, I just, we'll just put that, put that away. Do not take the dog for a walk because the dog will find a squirrel and go after it with you on the leash after it. So have your partner bring that one through, but you're going to take it easy for those first three weeks. And then depending upon the surgery, we'll typically ramp up to full activity, six weeks, heavier things like heavy yoga, golf, tennis, mountain climbing, semi-pro volleyball playing, be on your Hobie cat, um, boogie boarding. These have all come up. Those are going to be out at more like eight weeks in general, but every patient has a specific regimen. And so that's all based upon their recreation activities and kind of what they- And, and what their surgery was to. too. So, so if they've had a bigger surgery, if they've had more going on, then they'll have a little more restriction. If they've just had say LVAs and that's it, they're going to be able to get back quicker than say a bigger They've had a scarred axilla. We've had to do a lot of release, really put things back together. The muscles are all over the place um, right. and we've reestablished that anatomy in a, in a good way, but that's gonna require some more healing. Gotcha. And then, so going back to the cording, when you do do the surgery for um, lymph node transfers from let's just say the groin to the axilla um, following um, breast cancer, do you generally always go through with the cording release? Oh, yeah. whether or not it caused them any issues because we've seen it a lot. And then the thought is it would be nice, but I just don't know like where that protocol is. If we're going to the axilla every time, that that's one of the absolute protocol things we do. Um, we'll, we will find that we actually find recipient arteries and veins that are say the socket we have to plug your cord into. So we disconnect from the, the groin area as an example, and then we'll take the artery and plug it in. But before we even do that, we'll go through, we'll range the arm means the arms gets prepped into the surgical field and see where things are stuck. We'll, I'll have marked those on the skin beforehand. We'll go and we'll specifically go for those scar bands first. And then we'll be able to see where the sheets of scar are. And, and sometimes there's a lot and sometimes there's less. And we'll go and divide all that scar too in multiple areas to really make things nice and soft and open and smooth. And then and then we'll be able to put that lymph node transfer tissue, that new tissue that's nice and healthy in there. And that prevents that scar from reforming or at least to that same degree. Otherwise, if you were to go and say, release that scar, it would be great for anywhere from three to six weeks, but that scar is just gonna heal back because there's unopposed scarring that's happening. If you put that healthy tissue in there, the, the scar tissue starts to heal, it finds good tissue. It says, hey, I'm done, no problem. And it doesn't make that cord. That is amazing um so then can i ask about the cording a little bit when you go in to release that is there a general area like more proximal more distal or is it dependent upon the range of how much scarring they have and um, right. what they need it, it's it varies person to person but mo almost always this cording occurs because there's been surgery or radiation in that armpit and that's where that tightening tightened area comes and they pop like guitar strings sometimes and you literally see them. It's really wonderful. They go snap, 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 and it releases and everything goes, is released. And if you picture a guitar too, you don't, it doesn't matter where you cut that string, it'll still release the tension on that string. So if all you have is the very end of the guitar to be able to make your cuts, mm -hmm. well, that will still release all the strings everywhere in there. And we find that too. So all those things relax down. We put the new tissue in there that prevents things from regrowing. So some people I know, other surgeons, there aren't very many lymphedema surgeons out there, but they'll say, I'm gonna put that lymph node transfer on the wrist. There are a lot of technical reasons. I don't like that, but you also lose the ability to- Get into that area. Get into that area and re relax all these scars. But I, I think that 
having that relationship with the therapist and really hearing what you guys are saying, what the patients are saying has always guided me. And, and one of the biggest improvements that they get from, for example, a lymph node transfer to the armpit is, is the release of that scar, is the improved range of motion, is the improved drainage that they have, and just feels better. They're not so tight. And, and that's a daily thing that they feel every day that's tight. They just get used to and just say, hey, this is what I'm stuck with now. And we can, we can improve right. that, that better. It's really wonderful. Right. It's actually really good to, to hear that because it's true, right? From my perspective as a physical therapist, when we don't get enough shoulder range, and let's just say it is a overhead sport, like your semi-pro athletes, um, volleyball or whatever it is, then they lose the range, they compensate somewhere else, but then they're also not getting full per se range of motion for the drainage that may need to happen through that area. Absolutely. So it is really nice to hear that it is possible from whatever area that you're at to be able to release some of that um, to help with their strength as well. Um, a couple more questions is how important is therapy from Dr. Granzel's perspective? I mean, ther therapy is critical. It's, it's, it, you have to have that relationship with the therapist. We have, uh, I think, you know, therapy is, I think, an underappreciated thing for, for most surgeons. And, and for me, I involve the therapist from the very beginning. The patient has to have a therapist and has to have a relationship with the therapist for them to even become a patient for me. Because we want to make sure that we're having that treatment that can occur with just therapy um, happen. And, and if that's enough, you don't need surgery. Okay. I don't want to have you come if you don't need surgery. Then we have you treated. That area that's treated is then going to be much easier to operate on if the therapies occurred properly. Um, intraoperatively, especially if we go from a stage two or stage one, I'm dredging out those tissue, dredging out those solids. I'm suctioning things out and I've, I've dropped that arm or leg volume tremendously. I mean, this week we did someone where we had to remove 8,900 cc's of tissue from a leg. It was a lot. That was how much it built up over years and years and years of this accumulation. And, um, and if I don't have the therapist apply the proper bandaging afterwards, we and we don't put the proper garments afterwards and we don't keep things down, that patient's drainage system is already damaged and that swelling is gonna come right back. This lymphedema process is gonna come right back and they might end up even worse than where they, worse compared to where they started with. So afterwards, the therapy is also extremely critical, especially for those bringing them down from a stage two to a stage one surgery. Um, for everything else too, the, the relationship with the therapist is key um, and then what I do really with the reconstructions is to make your job easier and how you treat the patients. So you'll be able to get more benefit from each treatment that you have. You're gonna see that arm and leg or leg comes down. It's gonna come down faster. The skin's gonna be softer. You're not gonna have those problem areas be as problematic typically as you would. And you're gonna get more out of your treatments that you have. To make, yeah, absolutely. But I, I, and I, but I do insist that the patients maintain that relationship with the therapist afterwards as well, because you're gonna need those occasional measurements. As we talked about, those measurements can change on your garment and probably will change and they will probably improve to go down, but we don't wanna lose that improvement too. So, so you need to be able to measure that and the fitter has to be able to bring that down. Thank you. Um, so another question that came up is, what percentage of your patients who have had the SAPL need to, need to or choose to come back for additional procedures of LNT and or LDAs. Yep, so SAPL or SAPL surgery is what we use. It's suction assisted protein lipectomy. And that's really why I'm taking those patients that have had not only the fluid build up, but you have those chronic permanent solids that build up and I can remove those solids and get you back down to just a fluid problem. So from that, what we're able to do is, is really affect a dramatic change where someone comes in with massively different armor leg. I mean, they can't even shop in the normal clothing section. They have to buy jeans, four sizes too big, and they always have to tailor in the opposite leg. And, and my expectation is I get you shopping in the normal clothing section, your infections go down by 80%. And this happens in 99 plus percent of my patients. Essentially, everybody who follows directions is gonna, my expectation is they're gonna be in that range. And, and relatively normalize the armor leg. Um, out of those patients, more and more patients are, are, are coming back for their second phase surgery because they wanna be able to then decrease the amount of compression that it requires to, to keep things down. Right. So the compression already decreases a little bit before and after the SAPL surgery, it never gets worse. 
there's not a need for compression afterwards that you didn't have before. I mean, if you're that damaged that you need that surgery, you need full-time compression already. So we decreased that down. And I mean, it's a, it's a higher and higher percentage, a pretty high percentage of patients that want to come back and, and do the full two-step because then they're able to say, realistically go to a wedding, be in their daughter's wedding, no garment, no compression for photos around, and maybe put that garment on when they're doing the, the, the reception afterwards, or go to the beach most of the day, wear a regular swimsuit, go to a pool party, wear a regular swimsuit, no compression, but you know, make it up afterwards in the evening or the next day. And, and those changes are so, um, there's, there's so, those are really, really life-changing improvements that we consistently can achieve that that it's um most patients are, are wanting to do that it's always so good to hear um and then any have you ever run into any issues following um like your excess drainage that you had just talked about uh, any issues with like skin right so excess skin do you do the skin um grafting then so so uh for me the I've never had an issue where I've had to graft skin back. That's if people are moving lymph nodes into an arm or leg and they put it on a wrist or an ankle and they can't close the area, they need skin grafts. I don't do that. There are a lot of, again, technical reasons. I hide them in the axilla mm -hmm. armpit where usually they have a big scooped out area that now fills in and it's more even. Right. Or in the leg, I put on the inside of the thigh. So it's very hidden. That area is very hidden and it's just as effective if it's, as if it's lower for me. Um, if you have, now, I think you're talking more about the excess skin. So say you take out 9,000 cc's out of someone's leg and there's all this floppy skin that was just holding the envelope in, what happens? I'll tell you in 98% of the patients or more, that skin actually retracts and shrinks down completely. Wow. So it's like heat shrink tubing that an electrician might use to shrink things yeah. down or, or, or a, a shrink wrap. Uh, there's so much inflammation that's still present in the skin from that chronic lymphedema that it actually pulls things together and will tend to pull things down. Now, certain cases, especially with legs, if you have such an advanced damage to your skin that that skin is actually irreversibly damaged and you have so much skin hanging before your surgery, even that looks like, say, you're wearing a bell bottom mm -hmm. or so, then, then we need to talk maybe about when we take out the um, material that I'll take out some of that excess skin and bring it in for you already because that skin is is really that damaged. I mean, it's just skin surface. When we have skin surface, then there's deeper skin, which is different than there's a, a fatty layer, then there's another fatty layer, and then you have fascia. I mean, these patients have one just inflamed layer and there's no difference between any of those layers. Well, those, those areas I, I can resect, but I mean, we've done it maybe half a dozen times. It's really very rare that we need to do that. I know that people, there is a colleague who advocates that, you know, and I think that works for him, but I find that leaving that skin, letting it go down, then also leaves those channels that are underneath intact that I can then make future connections with. Mm -hmm. If it shrinks down, there's less healing issues that you're going to have. You're going to have less scarring, more channels I can, that I can connect. And the more close I can stay to an anatomic reconstruction or, or what that patient's true anatomy was, the better I think their healing will be. That's great. Um, and then lastly, impact of like blood pressure, blood sugar. So a patient who may have comorbidities like diabetes or something of that nature, how does that impact their um, recovery as well as their consult with you for um, surgery? Right. So when patients call our office, we'll go through an extensive list already of things that they might or might not have. So for example, if they don't have a therapist, they need to get one or else we're not going to, we're not really going to be able to, to talk, or at least they're going to, maybe they have a good reason for it and we can get them connected with someone. Um, if they, if they're an active smoker, Hey, you, you got to quit or else it's, you're not going to be able to do that surgery because that will definitely impact healing. Mm -hmm. Diabetes being out of control is a big one. And if the diabetes and your H1C is too, or A1C is too high, um, that will definitely impact, impede your healing. So you need to get that controlled before you can be a surgical candidate for the lymphedema surgery. We'll still have you get conservative therapy in the meantime. So you're still gonna be visiting your therapist. We're still gonna keep those things under control, but you just won't be able to do the surgery in all these cases. Other things that are going to be comorbidities means you have something else going on that would make you less safe for surgery 
are dealt with in the same way that they would be for any other surgery. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have heart problem, if you have you know, kidney problem, whatever it is, whether you're going in for a knee replacement or lymphedema surgery, there are certain things that we go through as a pre-op checklist or clearance. We perform risk stratification. We get with your treating physician as to how to optimize you. And we make a decision with possible increased risk of, well, hey, you've got you know, heart arrhythmia, it's controlled, but you're probably at higher risk than someone who doesn't. Is that okay with you to, to do the surgery? Our surgeries are safe, but that, you know, that's like someone who has a car that's not running quite as straight and is it gonna handle as well in the rain as one that doesn't? Well, you know, that's a little bit extra risk that you take and that's how life, that's what- Hold on a second if I need to look at that. Okay, so that is all we have on our questions list from what we've talked about, Dr. Granzo. Now, let me just check the chat really quick to see if there's anything else that did come up by some of our participants. Um, so we talked about all of those things. It looks like you've answered everybody's questions. Um, any last thoughts as to tidbit uh, clinical pearls for someone who is not sure if they have lymphedema or is a little hesitant of seeing somebody for a consult, um, what they need to look for and kind of how they can um, be in contact with or find resources for something of that nature. Yep. So I would always tell someone if, if in doubt, just see the lymphedema therapist first, they're going to be very well trained and be able to sort out things that you have going on. And even if you have a swelling that's not due to lymphedema, there is going to be a lot of improvement you're going to achieve, whether it's a venous swelling, if it's a diabetic, if, if it's for a number of other reasons, that's your first step. And that's the best first step. As far as choosing a surgeon, I think um, you want to make sure that it's someone who does this all the time. It's not a one-off or they don't do one or two a year or they're, they're just hoping to be able to build a practice with it. It's not, there's, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. It, there's a lot, we do it a lot better now than we did five or 10 years ago. And, and there is a progression that we have and, and we have a real dedication to what we do. We have an, a big team that's set up and we have a, a very specific process we go through because we know what works and what doesn't work very effectively. So I think those are, would be your two biggest takeaways. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Granzo. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to kind of have this conversation with us and give us a little bit more of a glimpse of, you know, your day in, day out. And I loved the grape analogy. I think I'm going to go with that when I have to explain how things are harvested. Um, so if anybody needs anything, I'll be here for a little bit. Um, in two weeks, we also do have another interview with um, Dr. Timothy Lesser. He is a urologist downstairs who um, we will be talking about prostate cancer with. So in the meantime, take care, stay well, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you too. Have a good one.